Hi, welcome back to uh, another lecture. In this video, I want to talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers. These were individuals who lived uh, um, around the 6th and 5th century BCE. Uh, these were uh, Greek, typically they're, they're, they're known as Greek philosophers, or as Greek philosophers. In reality, they, uh, they all came from... Uh, from this area right here that um, we call Turkey today, um, which at the time was referred to as Ionia. Um, so sometimes these philosophers are, are referred to as Ionians. This is, happens to be also the, uh, the area of very early civilizations where they, uh, they found the first signs of uh, the discovery of agriculture, 8,000 to uh, 5,000 BC. Now, I have to say that <clears throat> lately they found, also, they found discoveries. Uh, they, they found it that um, civilizations are much, much older, um, even older than agriculture, but that's a, that's a whole different story. I don't even want to get into that. But um, before I talk about the, uh, the pre-Socratic pre -Socratic philosophers, let me just uh, give you a, a, a visual uh, idea. A visual idea. Have I thought about that? Um, of the timeline of philosophy just to understand where we are. So we're here at the present time. Now, we are in the, what is referred to as the postmodern um, post uh, era of philosophy. Because the modern, modern philosophy is stretches from the 1500s or I actually I should say 1600s, it's more correct. 1600s uh, with René Descartes, <clears throat> Galileo, well, Galileo, 1500s, to uh, the 1940s, 1950s. Yeah. Before that, there is medieval philosophy, early medieval and medieval philosophy. Now, when you go back before the medieval philosophy, say, before the, uh, the year 600, you see that this is 600 CE, which means Common Era, or uh, formerly known as uh, AD, after the birth of Christ, Anno Domini, that's what AD meant. Here is the birth of Christ, or the year zero. Now, we're talking about the first philosophers lived around this period of time. This is when Western philosophy begins. Eastern philosophers are much older. 600 BC, so 600 years before the birth of Christ, these people lived. And it was, these were all men. Unfortunately, we're all men and white men. That's what it was. Civilizations, as you can see, started here, much, much farther back. Okay? Uh, but as far as we know, in the West, it all began, began right here. Now, why are these individuals referred to as um, Pre-Socratic philosophers. The uh, the word of pre-Socratics seems to suggest that they uh, they came before Socrates, and some some of them indeed came before Socrates, but not all. Um, several of these figures were contemporary of philosophy uh, of Socrates. Socrates lived. Uh, <coughs> was born in 469 and died in 399. Uh, so uh, 
why the the, uh, the term pre-Socratics? Well, uh, it, it's it's a funny thing actually to explain because Socrates is so important in the history of philosophy. Like Jesus, for example. Jesus is so important that essentially our calendar is structured around uh, the birth and, uh, of Jesus. We have the year zero, before and after. Same thing for Socrates in philosophy. Socrates was so important that either you are Socrates or you are not Socrates. If you are Socrates, you are Socrates. If you are not Socrates, you are a pre-Socratic philosopher. That's, that's the name of pre-Socratic philosophers. So, the very first pre-Socratic philosopher, the, the grandfather of Western philosophy, is Thales of Miletus. Thales lived uh, from 624 was born, died in 546. These obviously are approximate dates. Uh, Thales was known as a true uh, genius, a true intellectual. Now, Thales, like many other philosophers, early philosophers, when we uh, study them, when we look at them in retrospect, we, um, we tend to call them more scientists than philosophers. Remember what I explained to you in the other video, the other lecture, that science comes from philosophy. Uh, before experimentation, before laboratories and telescopes, well, you have to rely on reasoning, a Russian uh, rationality, and reasoning, logic, and argumentation. Thales was concerned about the cosmos. He was not concerned so much about, at least as far as we know, he was not concerned about uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, life or the interaction of human beings. He was mostly interested in astronomy, what we call today, might call astronomy, um, and astrophysics, and cosmogony, the study of the universe. He was so, um, uh, so smart, so skilled in astronomy that it is said that he uh, uh, predicted an, a solar eclipse in the year of 585. It, it is also said that he was the one who uh, divided the, uh, the year into 365 days. He also, uh, it is said that, that he traveled to Egypt where uh, he learned uh, mathematics and astronomy. Um, one of the, uh, the things that he's known for is measuring the pyramids. By, essentially, he weighted the, uh, the time of the day when your shadow is as high as you, then he uh, used the shadow of the pyramid to, uh, to find the hypotenuse. Uh, and this, if it sounds familiar, is because it is said that uh, he already knew what is attributed to uh, Pythagoras, the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, apparently, the uh, the Egyptians already knew this. Now, among many other things, all these things that he's famous for, Thales, he was famous for uh, um, a very important doctrine, <clears throat> the doctrine that everything according to uh, uh, Thales uh, is made of water. It comes from water and is made of water. Um, earth is floating on water. This is deduced by the fact that when you uh, walk far to uh, uh, and arrive at the end of a landmass, 
you find water. According to Aristotle, Thales was, um, uh, was very poor. But this is because he was not interested in learning. Because uh, what, what Aristotle wants to demonstrate is that philosophers are not interested in money. They're interested in thinking. They're interested in discovering the truth about the universe. Uh, so he tells the story about Thales that he was poor and people made fun of him and, and said to him that that's, the, uh, that's proof that philosophy is useless. So the story goes that, that Thales, since Thales was very uh, skilled in astronomy, he uh, predicted that next year, next summer's harvest of olives was going to be uh, plentiful. So he, uh, he made a deposit with a little money that he had, and it, and it bought all the rights for all the, the olive, uh, olive oil businesses. And he obtained these at, at a very low price. So when the season for uh, making oil came, he had all the rights. And, uh, and so he could sell it at whichever price he wished. And so he did. And he made a, a bundle demonstrating people that a philosopher can make lots of money if she wants to or he wants to. But they're not interested. They're interested in uh, uh, more, you know, higher things, uh, intellectual things. Now, let's go back to uh, his main doctrine, that everything is made of water. Now, did Thales believe that everything, really everything is made of water, like this cell phone is made of water? <clears throat> we don't really know. We have to rely on the words of Aristotle, because Aristotle seems to have read uh, Thales' writings, Thales' books probably, which we don't have, <clears throat> or we might have fragments of, of them. And at any rate, Aristotle <clears throat> sorry, is a pretty reliable individual, I would say. So what does he say about Thales? He says, Thales said that the principle is water, for which reason he declared that the earth rests on water. Perhaps he got this notion from seeing that the nutrition of all things is moist, and that heat itself is generated from the moist and kept alive by it, and that from which they come to be is a principle of all things. Perhaps he also got this notion from the fact that the seeds of all things have moist nature. For example, sperm. The sperm <coughs> is moist. It's water. <coughs> and water is the origin of nature, of the nature of moist things. So, uh, first of all, Thales thought that reality is composed of only one thing. Now, of course, water, we know today that everything is not made of water. Water is not the quintessential element. But what's important, uh, it, it seems from many philosophers, is the, uh, the kind of reasoning uh, that Thales used. The idea that reality, the true nature of reality escapes us because we are stuck in uh, our senses, so to speak. However, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the task of philosophy and metaphysics is to identify the primary uh, substance of the universe. And we can, um, <clears throat> we can perceive it through our senses because we are stuck in our, in our, in our uh, senses. However, we also have intellect, <clears throat> and through the intellect, intellect is this thing that, that transcends the senses. So the senses uh, enables you to see things, to feel things, to smell things. 
but never penetrate into uh, the true nature of reality. However, knowledge, the intellect, reasoning alone, reasoning allows you, is that tool that allows you to go further, uh, to go beyond the, 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 uh, the senses. <clears throat> Just think about the fact that, for example, a lot of the things that we know in science are known through mathematics, which is an abstract uh, discipline. Consequently, Thales had in mind the distinction between appearance and reality. This is very important. Uh, it's don't take it for granted because back then, you know, 600 years before the birth of Christ, this was not uh, an obvious. Uh, an obvious notion and it's still today for some people is not an obvious, obvious notion some people still believe nowadays that what you see is what you get uh, what you see is reality I see this room I see the table and that's what reality is about that's a kind of a naive um, view of the world uh, the world that has many levels of reality and with quantum physics especially we have learned that reality uh, at, at the very fundamental level is not made of tables and pizzas and babies it's made of vibration is made of uh, things that we can't really see or explain fully explain uh, with our language we have to use mathematical concepts in order to understand this. Um, so Thales is important historically because he introduced this new idea of thinking of the world, the reality versus the, uh, uh, the illusion of the senses. Thales had a student named Anaximander. Anaximander Anaximander's principle was uh, that he disputed the, the, uh, the notion that water is a quintessential element. Uh, well, for one reason, for example, you can, you can tell that water can, cannot be the, uh, the quintessential element because, for one thing, how do you explain fire? How can you uh, possibly say that fire is made of water when they seem to be pretty opposite? No, it's not water. He thought that, he arrived at the conclusion that it, since there is, there must be a quintessential element. This quintessential element can't be something that has a shape, a form, uh, something familiar, like water. It's got to be a substance that is odorless, shapeless, boundless. And he called it the unlimited, or the boundless. Um, <clears throat> the boundless, he says, is the original material of existing things. Further, the source from which existing things derive their existence is also that to which they return and their destruction according to necessity. So it's a kind of a, it's similar to the idea of energy that we have today. The energy uh, is not something that we can see yet we can touch. And it's eternal. Uh, energy cannot be created or destroyed in a, in, a, in a closed system. In our system, energy is comes and goes, but it, it, it never goes out of existence. It's always there. It's redistributed, so to speak. I think that's, that's what he had in mind. Um, so this boundless is... According to Aristotle, uh, according to uh, Aristotle's interpretation, uh, uh, he he thinks that uh, uh, Anaximander thought that 
this boundless stuff is the origin of everything, the hot and the cold, the water, the air. So for an, an, an Eximander, everything originates, as I said, and dissolves into uh, the unlimited stuff. When uh, you eat an apple, you throw the, uh, the core, that decomposes and becomes the unlimited. As I said, again, it's very similar to the idea of energy. You know, now in science, modern scientists today would say that that apple decomposes its atoms, go back into uh, the universe, and uh, they mix with other things. Um, <clears throat> now, interesting his theory about the uh, the Earth. Earth uh, is suspended in air by, um, by, by the forces of nature, the opposites, okay? Uh, it's a better explanation than water because if, you know, if you think that water is what holds Earth, what holds the water? An Eximander had, in, uh, in his turn, had a student, an Eximenes, and uh, he thought that this idea of the, uh, the boundless, the unlimited, was preposterous. Because to say that there is a substance that has no smell, no uh, shape, no form, no taste, and so on, it's merely, it's either a poetical, metaphorical, or it's not pure nonsense because... It's something that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't feel, you can't detect. You might as well say it's nothing. Uh, and uh, the quintessential element must be something, something that exists. And the best candidate for the job is air. Yes, air. The soul is air. Uh, and Eximen is right, as our souls are made of air, hold us together, so breath and air embrace the entire universe. Air is all around us. Air is fundamental for life. So it is air that produces everything. But how do you produce a table from air? Well, if you condense air somehow, you can, uh, you can create tables and babies and pizzas. Um, and also, you can explain how air can sustain the world, the planet. Now, let's uh, move on to a, a more interesting philosopher that everybody knows. And the name is Pythagoras. I'm sure you all, at this point of your life, know Pythagoras' theorem. Um, so you, you, uh, you always heard the name Pythagoras associated with mathematics. And in reality, Pythagoras was a philosopher. His, uh, his study of numbers was philosophical. He wrote other books on education and other things. We don't seem to have those books. Uh, what we know is that he made uh, discoveries in mathematics, like the square of a number, the cube, uh, and so on. <clears throat> uh, but all these discoveries, as I said, all these uh, notions that he studied were really f philosophical in nature. He was interested not in, uh, in knowing math well, but rather knowing the universe well. So, he says that, his doctrine is that the soul is something different from life and is immortal. Well, a lot of, a lot of people, he's not the first one. A lot of um, philosophers especially Indian philosophers, <clears throat> thought that this idea of reincarnation, that the soul is the actual, 
essence of a person. Uh, his main doctrine that is interesting, very interesting, is that it seems to be original, no, no one else had, had thought about it before, was that the nature of reality, reality itself, is made up not of water or air or uh, the unlimited stuff, but it's made of numbers. By numbers, I mean portions, mathematical relations. So if you uh, understand, that's why he studied mathematics so much, because if you understand mathematics, you understand the universe. He also, he's also known for, uh, um, uh, for creating, inventing music the way we know it. It's not that he invented music, but he studied music uh, and he discovered many things about music. Uh, one of the, the things that he discovered is this uh, tetractus shape. As you can see, it's a, it's a shape made of 4, 3, 2, 1, which makes 10. There are four rows, air, earth, fire, and water. And... Uh, <clears throat> The ratio between four and three, and three and two, and two and one, is what um, what regulates the whole universe. Um, so the uh, this tetractus, the shape, is the form of all reality. This mathematical um, harmonious relationship between numbers. According to Sextus Empiricus, uh, another ancient philosopher, says that the tetract is, is a certain number which begins, uh, which being composed of the first four numbers, produced, uh, produces the most perfect number, 10. Um, this is because the entire cosmos is organized according to harmony. And harmony is a system of three intervals. If you study music, you study <clears throat> these intervals. You know, the fourth is a very... Um, <clears throat> now, there are many other intervals between notes, but uh, between the, 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 uh, the seven notes, there are these, these, uh, these four uh, um, relationships or intervals. The fourth and the fifth and the octave. So Pythagoras declared that the soul is immortal um, and, um, and so uh, he believed in, in a reincarnation. For this reason, he was against, uh, really spoke against uh, eating uh, any kind of uh, uh, meats, animals, because, because of not because of the, uh, uh, like nowadays people are concerned about animals, but because he was concerned about the soul. The soul is very important. So uh, um, soul can migrate and enter the body of an animal. And that's, that's like cannibalism. You can't eat uh, the soul. Plants don't have soul, so eat plants. The soul is established in the body through numbers, through number, which is to say through uh, immortal and incorporeal harmony. So uh, mathematics and music are the keys to unlocking the secrets of reality uh, because reality is composed of mathematical relationships. I mean, it's not a uh, secret that uh, even today, we know, we know this, uh, that mathematics is, as I said, the, uh, the secret, it's the language that enables us to understand reality. All the calculations made by scientists are made uh, in terms of mathematics. When uh, they study planets, uh, 
when they study the stars, when they study the behavior of bodies, uh, and also the behavior in, in quantum physics, quantum mechanics, when they studied the, the behavior of subatomic particles. They all use mathematics to understand how these things behave. That's a, that's a profound uh, uh, observation from the part of, of Pythagoras. Something that is very modern. Think about it without any uh, computers or any uh, tools, probably independently, without any university or research. He discovered this. It's, it's really remarkable. Okay, let's move on to... Uh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus, <clears throat> very interesting philosopher. Her for Heraclitus, nothing is the same. Everything is in constant motion. I mean, look at, look at a, a river, he says. Uh, you cannot step into the same river twice. By the time you step in, you put your, your foot into the, 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 uh, the river, <clears throat> The water has changed, but also consider the fact that obviously Heraclitus could not have known this, but uh, at a microscopic level, things change. For example, your, uh, you have changed in ways that your eyes cannot see, but you have changed uh, um, <clears throat> since you, you, uh, you started watching this video. There are very small changes that happen. Nothing is permanent the same. Everything seems to be moving, keep moving like a train, just going and going and going. Okay? Everything flows and nothing abides. Everything gives new way and nothing stays fixed. Uh, for Heraclitus, nothing is permanent. In a, in a passage that he wrote, he equates everything in the universe with fire. He says there is exchange of all things for fire and of fire for all things. As there is where, <clears throat> as there is <clears throat> of wares of gold um, and gold of wares. He didn't believe that what underlines the universe, the quintessential element, is fire. Uh, it's a mistake. He uses fire as a metaphor because when you look at fire, uh, it looks like one thing, but in reality, it's rather a process, something that constantly moves around and changes. Um, and that's, that's what the universe is. If you think about it, nothing is permanent. Everything is in constant motion. Also, there is no uh, enduring substance. Everything, every substance in the universe, every uh, stuff, matter, everything changes. Everything is becoming. So, uh, it, it, now Heraclitus, Her Heraclitus' theory seems to deny the theories of all the previous philosophers, where we have Pythagoras saying that there's an order in nature and, uh, and the universe, the whole universe is made of numbers <clears throat> or water or air, the other philosophers thought. But for Heraclitus, there is no quintessential element because everything is in constant motion. And so he uh, denies the, uh, that there's anything objective, that there's anything that is true for me and for you. If everything is in constant variation and motion and change, then there's nothing the same, nothing is the same for uh, two people. Um, so Heraclitus sees the universe as eternal, Um, but within the universe, everything that we know changes. 
Now, of course, there is one thing that it doesn't change for Heraclitus. And uh, you guessed it. The fact that everything changes never changes, which is a puzzle because it would be absurd to argue nothing changes. But is the notion that nothing changes something that changes? No. According to Heraclitus, that doesn't change. That is permanent. Okay? <clears throat> So, uh, well, let's move on a little bit. Um, so for Heraclitus, the world uh, can't be uh, pinned down to one element. Now, interesting because Parmenides and other philosophers, another philosopher, thought exactly the opposite, that Nothing changes. Heraclitus must be wrong. Nothing really changes in the world. In fact, it's even wrong to speak about the world and us. Because there's only one thing. The one. Reality is one. Reality is being. Being in the, in the sense of existence. Okay? Being is reality and there is one. Nothing becomes, nothing changes, because reality doesn't change. <clears throat> if it changes, then how do you explain the change? Now, let's look into this theory a little closer. There's appearance. Okay? There's the distinction, again, this distinction between appearance and reality. That... All these philosophers seem to uh, uh, have understood. The senses, you have to understand, the senses give us a certain picture of reality. But as we all know, even nowadays, reality is not made of tables and pizzas and babies but rather is made of more fundamental things that scientists study, vibrations, strings, and so forth. So, our senses are not giving us a true picture of the world. They're biased. Our eyes are human eyes. <clears throat> Who is to say that the world really looks like the way we perceive it. it might be different. Who is to say that when I touch this table, this computer, or this bottle of water, it is really smooth the way it is, it is see-through and so on. These are just illusions created by the senses. So consequently, what can we deduce from this? We can deduce that the senses... <clears throat> cannot be trusted when it comes to uh, reality. We know that we're wrong. Let me give you a, a, a one, one example. The, uh, based on our senses, people believed that, uh, that the world, not the world, but Earth, is fixed is at the center of the universe. And, uh, and the sun rises and and falls, right? <clears throat> and uh, revolves around us. That's based on the senses. But what made us know that it's not the case? That in fact we go around the sun? <clears throat> well, that's, uh, that's the intellect. That's reasoning. So, uh, according to... Uh, Parmenides, we must listen to reason, not trust the senses. Okay, so the senses, sure, tells uh, tell us that things change, uh, things become, go out of existence, but how can we trust the senses? 
we have to trust intellect, we have to trust reasoning. What does reasoning say about this? Well, let's analyze this argument. First of all, um, first of all, okay, as I was saying, sorry about the interruption, let's look at the argument. Let's start with this premise. Not being cannot be grasped by the mind. Now, what does this mean? It means, can you think of nothing, nothingness? I mean, what I mean is, can you think of non-being? It seems obvious that you cannot. Because how can you think of non-existence. If it doesn't exist, you can't picture it in your mind. How can you picture nothingness? Now you can say, oh wait a minute, I can picture nothingness. I'm just thinking of, I close my eyes and I, and I, and I can visualize an empty space with uh, all dark, with no light, nothing. But, but think about this. An empty space is something. I'm not talking about an empty space, but I'm talking about nothing at all, not anything. You can't do it. You can't think about it. Not only that, but you can't even talk about it. What can you say about nothing? It has no characteristics, no uh, shape, no form. Consequently, let's, let's move on to the next step of the argument. <clears throat> Being, existence, okay, cannot not be. Because if it does exist, it cannot exist and not exist at the same time. It must exist. I know that it seems to you that things can cease to exist, go out in and out of existence. For example, babies are born, uh, things uh, um, disappear, and so on. But again, think about this. How do you know that things come into existence? How do you know that things go out of existence? Yes, you know it through your senses. It's always our experience, experience of, through our senses that tell us, oh look, a baby is born. We see it, okay? But once again, going back to the, uh, the idea, we cannot trust the senses. The senses gives, give us this illusion of reality. But the true nature of reality has to be discovered through reason. Um, so anything that, that can be thought exists, okay? So if what is real is what can be thought, and if not being or nothing cannot be even thought, then reality is only being. Reality is only being. There's nothing in reality that is not being. Okay? So there are only two categories. Being, not being. Things that exist and things that do not. Of these two, there is only one category of reality. Being, which is Anything that can be thought about. Not being cannot be thought about. Shouldn't even be mentioned because it's just an illusion of the senses. Now, from these points, from these uh, uh, intuitions, being is and not being is not. Parmenides deduced. Uh, 
arrive at the conclusion uh, that, first of all, being is eternal, okay? It was not created nor destroyed. So reality is eternal. I mean, think about it. Why is eternal? Because according to this argument, if reality doesn't exist, and then it does exist at one point, how did he go from non-being to being? It would be impossible, okay? Because out of nothing, nothing comes. And so uh, reality must be eternal. The second point, the second conclusion is that being is also indestructible. Anything that exists cannot be destroyed completely. Oh, we know that. We know that. You can't really destroy matter. Uh, a, a body that decomposes, the atoms go back into the, uh, the system. Okay? Third conclusion. Being, this is probably the most important one, that since being is indestructible, being must be one. It must be indivisible. Because if you can divide something, there must be nothing in between. But nothing doesn't exist, remember? So uh, you can't split anything. There are no holes in between things. And consequently, <clears throat> reality is being, and being is indivisible, indestructible, eternal, and so it is one. There are no parts. I know. You see in reality, you see cars, bicycles, uh, guitars, televisions, that's just uh, an illusion of our senses. In reality, at the most fundamental uh, level of reality, um, the universe is only one thing. Frozen, doesn't move, doesn't go out of existence, doesn't come in existen into existence, doesn't go anywhere. It's just one. It never changes. That's a bizarre uh, view of the world. But his student, Zeno, didn't think so. He thought that his teacher was really right. Zeno is famous for uh, <clears throat> writing uh, uh, a series of paradoxes. Paradoxes to show that, that um, it is true that nothing comes and goes, nothing changes. More specifically, he uh, wanted to demonstrate <clears throat> from, from uh, Parmenides' notion of the one, he wanted to demonstrate that even that motion is impossible. Things don't move, don't go anywhere. One of the, uh, the paradoxes is the, uh, the paradox of the stadium runner. He says, Imagine there's a runner running around the track. Before the runner gets to the finish line, obviously he has to run um, a, uh, a quarter way point. He must pass the, uh, must pass the, the quarter way point. Uh, before that, well, first the half point, then the quarter point, then the eighth way point. So you see where this is going. Before you, uh, you uh, uh, cover any distance, you have to uh, cover an infinite number of sub points because any distance can be divided into an infinite number of points. So since there is an infinite number of points, never end, 
then you will never get to the end of any distance, which leads uh, him to uh, Zeno to deduce that, to conclude that motion is impossible, nothing really moves. Another such paradox is the paradox of the arrow. Observe an arrow in, uh, in air. You think it's moving, he says, but it's not moving because the arrow is always where it is. It's never where it is not. In other words, the arrow always covers, always, always occupies occupies uh, the same amount of space. It is never in a different um, uh, amount of space. It's always there. It, it, it is almost as if you uh, um, could shoot a video and, uh, and then look at each um, frame of the, uh, of the, uh, the film and see that the arrow is always there. It's always frozen. You say, but, but wait a minute. But I can see that it's moving. But once again, it is the senses that, uh, that, that give rise to that illusion that everything is moving. But it's not moving. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> the next one, the next philosopher I want to talk about is Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras had pretty uh, radical ideas. For example, um, in the ancient world, if you know this, if you don't know, I'll tell you. In the ancient world, they thought that the sun was uh, a god or um, some kind of special entity. Nothing like Earth, nothing like a piece of rock. The Egyptians, for example, venerated the sun. For an Exagoras, the sun is just a piece of metal burning in the sky, a giant piece of metal. Okay. Um, he also disputed that <clears throat> there were any kind of gods responsible for what happens on on earth earthquakes just produced by um by air when air returns into uh, the earth it shakes it um he, he seems to have had a uh, some sort of um theory of evolution where all the animals are generated by by moisture uh, and uh, and evolve um, and he was uh, um, Im imagined his ideas were very radical he was prosecuted um, for impiety uh, they thought that he was I mean it's blasphemous to think these things that the the, uh, the the sun was just a ball of iron in the sky. And, um, and he was kicked out of town for having entertained these ideas. Now, the next two, uh, Leo Kippus and Democritus, these two are... One of the one is the uh, the, the teacher, one is the student, <clears throat> but I group them together uh, because they they are essentially they're famous for uh, uh, the idea of atoms. They are the uh, the people responsible for uh, the notion of atoms that we have. Essentially, they arrive at the conclusion that when you uh, taken an object say that you want you want to cut it in half you can split it in half split it again quarters eighths and so on 
But then what's going to happen if you continue this exercise and you keep splitting this, this object? Well, you can think of two uh, options. One is you get to the point where you, uh, you split everything and there's nothing left. Now, the question is, if there's nothing left, what was the, uh, let's say an apple, okay, you split an apple, there's nothing left, then what is the apple made of? Nothing? So the, uh, the only logical conclusion is that there must be something at bottom. When you, uh, when you split an object, like an apple, you, uh, <clears throat> you get to the point where uh, there is uh, one thing left, and that thing is the quintessential element. It is the building block of reality, and that he called the atom, the seed of reality, the seed of things. Um, here's the, uh, the explanation of Aristotle. You can read it on your own. Um, <clears throat> so material objects, according to Democritus, constantly give off atoms, and these atoms um, make contact with our senses, with our eyes, uh, and... Uh, and that's that's how they uh, they make their ways into their into our soul, okay. And as a result, they give us images, sounds, for example. But our senses, again, once again, there's this idea that our senses are inaccurate um, instruments. And so all the colors, the sounds, the odors, the taste, all our, um, our sensorial experience exists only in our minds. Everything is caused by these atoms reacting, okay, when, in, when uh, interacting with the soul. Um, so... To explain reality for uh, Leo Kippus, for Democritus, we explain reality as a, uh, an infinite vacuum of space. Where Now, by vacuum, I mean there's nothing that contradicts Hermenides. There's nothing, and there's an infinite number of these seeds or atoms that come together <clears throat> in and, and each atom, by the way, is unique. They have different shapes and forms. And they, uh, they come together, they connect, and they create uh, things, create people, tables, and so on. They are indestructible. They, uh, uh, they can be destroyed because, remember, they, you can't split them any further. So they are the building blocks of reality. And... Um, now, another conclusion that he made from this is that <clears throat> he thought, look, if everything is made of these atoms, and these atoms are, well, they're not intelligent, they don't have uh, a mind of their own, and we are made of such atoms, it's a better argument, by the way, but that's his argument. What follows from this? It follows that we also don't have a mind. In what sense? Well, in the sense that we are like no more, uh, <clears throat> no different from a tree, for example. A tree grows bra a branch. Uh, it's got leaves and fruit, and the leaves fall down. All this happens to the tree. And not because the tree 
chooses to do that. The same thing happens to human beings. We have things happening to us. We think that we are responsible for these things. We think that we can choose. But that's just an illusion created by the senses. In reality, everything that we do it has to be done. Everything that we experience, it has to be experienced. This, <clears throat> we're going to talk about this in a different lecture. This is known as determinism. Everything is determined. Imagine a, uh, a long file of domino pieces where you uh, set off the first piece, the first piece hits the second one, and the second one hits the, the, the third one, and so on, and it knocks down all the pieces. Now, <clears throat> think about the last domino piece that stands, right? And it falls down, and it says, I fell down because I want to fall down. No, that's nonsense. You fell down because a series of events that preceded you and uh, and determined that you would fall down. That's the idea of determinism. But we're going to talk about determinism uh, more in depth in a different lectures, <clears throat> different lecture. <clears throat> All right. The next philosopher is Protagoras, who uh, is famous for uh, uh, for saying that man is the measure of all things. Possibly he was influenced by all these, uh, these previous philosophers that we talked about who believed that the senses um, don't produce any knowledge and so, uh, so we are stuck with, with our senses. Knowledge, uh, I mean reason can't do really anything about it. And so um, <clears throat> Anything, everything is relative. What is true to me might be false to you, um, and, and vice versa. So uh, he, uh, he was a uh, proponent of relativism. In conclusion, before I talk about Socrates, Pre-Socratic philosophers have gave us a very interesting and uh, and very radical theories of reality. A lot of these theories might sound bizarre to you, but what's important, I think, is the fact that they did all this, they arrived at all these conclusions, they produced all these theories without any, uh, any help. You know, nowadays you have scientists co uh, uh, cooperating from all over the world in discovering things. But back then, they, uh, they didn't have universities. They didn't have a unified body of science. So it's pretty remarkable that they just uh, used uh, their their, their minds to, uh, to discover things that, a lot of things that still are valid today. Uh, and so we can say that they are the, 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 true, uh, uh, the true creators of science, of modern science. Without them, we probably wouldn't be here uh, thinking what we think and uh, having the discoveries made the discoveries that we have made. This is the, uh, the power of philosophy. This is what philosophers are. This is what philosophy is. It's a very good illustration of that. Now, let's talk about, for a moment, very quickly about Socrates. Socrates was born in 470, died in 399. He is a contemporary of many of these individuals. <clears throat> He wrote nothing. He was, uh, um, actually, he also 
was very adamant about it to say that he was not a teacher. He said, I, I'm not teaching, I don't teach anything. You teach yourself. Uh, I just help you remember what, what, what's in your mind, but I don't teach you anything. So what do we know about Socrates? Well, we know about Socrates from the writings of Plato, uh, principally, um, and um, maybe some here and there mentions of Socrates in, uh, in Aristotle's work. Socrates, very different from all these philosophers that I mentioned, because Socrates is, doesn't seem to be interested, um, maybe not at all, but it doesn't seem to be interested in, uh, in the nature of reality. He's interested in, uh, in the nature of the human condition. He's interested in morality, he's interested in our lives, how we relate to one another, how we live. He uh, was very um, um, well, he was against uh, the, uh, the Sophists. Sophists were a, a group of people uh, more or less who uh, taught to others that everything is relative. Morality is relative. What is right to you, it might be wrong to me and vice versa. There is no uh, uh, one morality for everyone. Socrates was against this uh, and, and he thought that right or wrong are absolute. It is the same for everyone. It doesn't matter that different civilizations have different interpretations, behaviors, uh, moral behaviors, that it doesn't show that morality is relative. There's, a, there's a, a right and a wrong for all. Now, let me tell you some basic uh, <clears throat> notions of Socrates that influenced many other philosophers to come. First of all, the philosopher is the lover of wisdom. He is the one who uh, defined philosophy as such. <clears throat> Philosophers are not people who are happy just uh, about living their, their own lives. In fact, in many cases, philosophers are not happy because they, they always struggle to think about the world and to think about how to improve the world. Um, that's, that's the origin of the famous phrase that it's attributed to Socrates. Uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. The second uh, feature of Socrates' uh, thought is that the true self is the soul. Okay. That's why Socrates is also attributed to saying that, uh, to saying, know thyself. The third is that since myself is really my soul, uh, it follows that happiness cannot be obtained through uh, <clears throat> the acquisition of of things, material things, that please the flesh, please the physical body, okay? Like a big house, a big meal, um, or anything else. True uh, happiness uh, is obtained through uh, virtue and wisdom. So the life of wisdom and virtue is the life of the philosopher. That's why philosophers, uh, in, in the end, according to Socrates, live a good life. The fourth is that to be happy, well, I said this, uh, you must acquire wisdom. Wisdom is 
the capacity to guide our behavior um, in such a way as to uh, overcome our physical necessities and uh, and unify our soul. Now, this idea of the harmony of the soul, uh, that the, the soul must be in harmony, comes from Pythagoras. He was influenced by Pythagoras, certainly. So a, a good person is a person that has a an ordered soul. This trickled down, by the way, into religion, for example, in Christianity, the idea of a good individual, uh, a moral individual, is an individual whose soul is in order. Um, and the order would be uh, God's, God's commands and so on. The fifth aspect of Socrates' thought seems to be that Socrates was very concerned with moral wisdom, okay? And uh, this is a very uh, interesting and controversial uh, topic in ethics, by the way, that many philosophers have discussed. <clears throat> the idea that if you know what the right thing is, you do it. How is that possible? Isn't it true that um, that people know that cer certain things are wrong for them and they do, they do it anyway? Well, Socrates would say, for example, uh, take something like like stealing money. Okay. Now, do uh, thieves? know that it is wrong or to a certain extent you could say I think Socrates would say well they know that society deems <clears throat> the act of stealing as wrong but obviously the thief doesn't think that it is wrong in itself because for the thief it is right it is the right thing to do because he needs money, and that's what he does, and that's right for him. But if he really comprehended, not that it, that stealing is wrong for society, for a certain society, but it is wrong uh, at a cosmic, uh, universal level. Okay, it is universally wrong. Then he will not steal. It's a very controversial idea. If you know what is right, then you do what is right. Always. Well, there's much more to say about Socrates, but I think this gives us a, uh, a good picture of what Socrates, who Socrates was and who the pre-Socratics were. Um, now, in this lecture, essentially, the, the idea of this lecture, uh, if you have to walk away with, it, with, a, with a, an idea... The idea of this lecture is to uh, understand what philosophy is uh, at the origin, how philosophy originated. Well, it originated because people back then were not content with explanations, mythological explanations. Okay, they uh, they wanted to explain the world uh, by using reasoning, by using logic, and uh, and so they did. They did, and they produced various theories. And then uh, something happens, uh, like 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 lightning. Okay, comes Socrates. Socrates changes philosophy forever, and he turns philosophy into a, a study of the uh, a study of morality. You can say that Socrates uh, invented the idea of ethics because he, uh, uh, he, he, he pans the, uh, 
um, the interest of philosophy toward morality. He asks, what can we do to live a good life? What is a good life? And that's what he, uh, what he thought and he discussed with, with friends, with other philosophers, for, for his entire life. And as you will see later in another lecture, that very quest for truth um, led Socrates to uh, trouble, a lot of trouble. But that's for another lecture. <clears throat> Thank you for watching this, and I'll see you all in the next lecture. Have a great day.